This is Gray Merchant of Magic. A while back, I asked who the Waluigi of Magic was. Not necessarily in terms of personality, but in how the fans and creators view and utilize the character. The most common response was Tybalt, but the one that I actually agree with the most was Dak Faden. Unfortunately, the post appears to have been deleted because the person who made it impersonated Elon Musk. <sighs> Basically, it talked about how Dak has one of the more elaborate meta responses, despite never being all that prominent in the actual game. Today, I'd like to go into the complete history of Dak, from his comic to conspiracy to World of the Spark and beyond to figure out why he generated such interest in a subset of players, but never truly managed to break into the hearts and minds of the player base as a whole, or Wizards of the Coast. I'll also be interviewing the creator of Dak, and author of his original comic run, Matt Forbeck. But first, I need to dress appropriately. Seamless. If I don't finish filming in time, I could go on a date like this. Please consider liking and subscribing to support whatever this is. The comic. Dak debuted in 2012 in IDW's confusingly named Magic the Gathering comic series. At the time, IDW was publishing a number of Hasbro titles, including a Dungeons & Dragons comic. The series was initially written by Matt Forbeck. He has a long history working in RPGs, collectible card games, licensed reference material, and original and licensed comics and prose. The story is canon, with Forbeck describing how he worked alongside Wizard of the Coast, in particular, then-creative director Brady Dahmermuth. Dak was created to give the comic team creative freedom. This differentiates the series from the current Boom Magic comic, which is non-canon, and the IDW Chandra comic, which was canon, but because of its character's importance, couldn't alter status quo. Forbeck was also given advanced access to the future Magic story, allowing him to incorporate elements of Innistrad Bach. The series was primarily illustrated by Martin Coccolo, a very experienced artist who has worked extensively for Marvel, DC, IDW, and beyond. Some additional artists occasionally sub in, often in flashbacks. The covers were illustrated by a rotating selection of individuals, many of whom were classic magic artists. The first printings of each issue included a promo card utilizing the comic cover as its art. They often feature flavor text referencing or quoting the issue. There are many variant covers as well. I'm also a big fan of them. The visual design of the character was created by artist Eric Deschamps. Now let's discuss the contents of the comic. I want to begin by stating that the covers are consistently great. Each is very original, but they're all immediately attention-grabbing and really dynamically arranged. I think utilizing them as actual card art was a really cool idea. Like all first issues of a Magic comic, this one begins with an explanation of basic concepts in a probably vain attempt to core non-Magic players into reading this. We then jump straight into things, with Dak running away from a Rakdos horde on Ravnica with a stolen sword. This is a very effective first page. It immediately grabs the reader's interest with clear danger, especially if you're already familiar with the Rakdos. The combination of seeing Dak in a bad spot and him providing comedic commentary instantly sets up the core of his character. He is constantly just barely getting out of scrapes, but he never loses his attitude. The art is also great. Kokolo is my personal favorite magic comic artist. I can't commend the arrangement of the elements, level of detail, and coloring enough. Colorist J. Edwin Stevens also deserves recognition. Dak continues to evade his pursuers, bumping into the full breadth of Ronica citizens, which is cool. After some more comedy and cool action art, Dak escapes by planeswalking to Fiora. He remarks upon the difficulty of planeswalking, which is a necessary inclusion given that the ability to easily leave the dimension would otherwise undercut the danger of him constantly being on the run. Unfortunately for Dak, he is wanted here too. After demonstrating a few magical abilities, Dak runs into an old flame, a married woman, who is significantly more into him than he's into her. An injured Dak swashbuckles away and eventually returns to Ravnica, like the set. He evades a mugger by turning invisible, which seems like it would have been useful earlier. Dak meets up with an old woman named Fadka who heals him. The origin of his red right hand is hinted at. A man named Vaklav tries to buy the stolen sword off of Dak. Dak returns to a safe house and uses psychometry, which allows him to steal spells from artifacts and potentially view associated memories. He is surprised to witness a vision of his hometown of Drakeston, Fiora. 
a mysterious woman named Sifa slaughters the town and mentions Innistrad. Dak is especially upset at the death of a woman named Mariel, which seems to return Sifa's youth, because that's the motivation for like half a woman in the fantasy genre. Dak recommits to tracking Sifa down. This is a great first issue. It's action-packed and compelling, while properly introducing the main character and ongoing plot. Issue 2 begins on Innistrad, with two Cathars named Ingrid and Stefan defending some humans from vampires. Strangely, the narration recaps the events of the first issue, which the intro page already did. This continues throughout the series. Stefan is killed, and Dak finestrates himself. He rushes to the defense of the innocents, demonstrating that he does have a heart of gold underneath everything. He reflects on how the ease of being able to leave makes sticking around an active and difficult choice a recurring theme for the character. He successfully gets the innocence to safety, but is captured in the process. Fortunately, Ingrid saves him. Unfortunately, Innistrad's vampires can fly. Oh, they fly now! They fly now! They fly now! Dak pulls the stolen blade on his pursuer, who recognizes it and flies away. Ingrid takes them all to her father, and ex who also recognizes the blade. He reveals that it grants its weirder power over vampires. Dak again consults the blade, learning that Sifa used it to command vampires into destroying Drakeston. I like the detail that the vampires are afraid of backlash. That's a very Fjorn concern. Dak realizes that Sifa was specifically hunting him due to his magical abilities. Meanwhile, the vampire from before reveals the blade's appearance to Sifa, who demonstrates that she can control vampires without it. The issue ends with Sifa about to have Dak described to her. Issue 3 begins with Sifa flexing on her vampiric minions. We realize she's actually putting on a performance with the Vampire Lord. Quick plug, if you're interested in vampires, you may enjoy my podcast, To My Chagrin, where I'm experiencing the Twilight franchise for the first time alongside superfan Grace. We discuss the characters, writing, folklore, weird parts, and everything else. After learning about Ingrid, she uses magic to track her down. Meanwhile, Dak gets in the middle of a Real Housewives episode, as Ingrid's father, Herman, wants him to leave, while Ingrid wants him to stay. Dak, afraid of more people being killed in his wake, leaves. He would confront her father and runs after Dak, who again reflects on the interpersonal difficulties of being a planeswalker. Something seems to be brewing between Dak and Ingrid, but he's afraid to get close to her. Dak tracks down the vampire lord that Sifa is holed up with. They reach the castle and confront the vampires. Dak is disarmed, but uses the power he took from the blade previously, gaining control of the vampires. He and Ingrid learn that Sifa's forces are attacking Herman. The issue ends with Dak running back. Issue 4 opens with Sifa interrogating Herman for information on Dak. E. Dak reaches the town and is spotted by Herman, who keeps his presence a secret. E. Sifa threatens the townspeople to get Herman to talk. E. Dak, unwilling to let another town die, attacks Sifa unsuccessfully. A brawl begins between Sifa's forces and the townspeople. Dak, tired from recent events and struggling to connect with Innistrad's unfamiliar mana, is captured. He reveals his identity to Sifa, but before she can kill him, Ingrid arrives with a squad of Cathars. Dak breaks free and throws ghosts at Sifa, but Sifa throws ghosts at Herman and Ingrid. Dak gives up his chance at vengeance to save them. Ingrid embraces Dak, but Herman urges him to go after Sifa. Dak plans walks away after her and is not happy with where he arrives. This concludes the first arc of Dak's story. It's quite strong, it's dense with content, which has not been the case with some other magic comics. It has a clear sense of momentum, with a good hook for the next arc. The characters are generally well written, with Dak in particular being quite compelling. He balances humor and emotional depth well, exploring the ramifications of Planeswalker life beyond what we often see. One thing I notice is that his grab bag of random abilities means that he can basically do whatever the plot demands of him, though the story generally does a good job of giving him various weaknesses to maintain tension. Issue 1 of The Spell Thief returns to the previous scene, revealing the location to be a new plane called Equire. I guess Dak swore twice. Maybe he swore a bunch in between issues, we didn't get to see it. Anyway, Dak breaks into the castle, escaping a dramatic trap. He encounters a massive storage room, full of various creatures. Some narc goblins attack him. Dak escapes, but runs into a Mercadian Katarin. The castle's owner, a collector nerd giant, arrives and captures Dak with sleep-inducing ghosts. He desperately wants to be a planeswalker. In his containment unit, Dak flashes back to the first time he was captured, in Alcaba, 
Years ago, he attempted to steal an artifact there, but was captured in the process. Here we learn the origin of his red hand. After waking up, Dak summons a Hellspark Elemental. In a cool bit of card accuracy, Dak mentions both that the Elemental quickly dies, and that's capable of coming back. Dak uses the distraction to planeswalk away to the first place he can get to, which ends up being Drixton. Issue 2 begins with a lengthy recap. A few letter issues do as well. Is that a Dublin Cube? After the flashbacks, Dak searches through Drixton and runs into one of the vampires that Sifa controlled into massacring the town. Dak confronts him using the power he took from the blade. He grapples with his urge for revenge and his understanding that the vampire was just another victim of Sifa. Dak ultimately spares him, appreciating that he buried all the bodies afterwards. Dak then assassins creeds himself to the bar of the Old Flame's husband from the first issue, who he apologizes to and gifts a bejeweled sword handle. Issue 3. There's a lot of throat grabbing in this series. Anyway, Dak returns to Innistrad, not like the set, and talks to Herman, who shows him Sifa's notes from her raided castle. Players may recognize Malfagor from Grixis. Ingrid arrives and is excited to see Dak. Ingrid and Herman wish to know Dak's true deal, so he finally tells them. We flash back to Dak and Mario on Fiora. Dak reveals that the last time he let someone get close to him, she was put in danger, explaining his current hesitancy. After finishing his story, Dak realizes that his hosts have been frozen by none other than Soren Markov. Dak has heard of a vampire planeswalker, but didn't believe it, as the undead can't planeswalk, which is a cool lore nod. Soren destroys the notes and admonishes Dak for revealing the existence of planeswalkers and other planes to regular people. He also wants the blade from before, which Dak gives him in return for Ingrid and Herman's safety and information on Sifa. Soren tells him that Sifa also hails from Grixis. Ingrid and Herman wake up but have no memory of Dak's revelation. After some angst, Dak leaves for Grixis. Issue 4 begins with Dak and Grixis in Malfagor's prison. I love the design of the prison, literally constructed from the remains of its victims. Cool card knot as well. Dak speaks with another captive, discussing that the cell has a power dampener. He also reveals that Sifa had once been imprisoned in the same location. We then flash back to Fiora, where a young Dak is first learning magic alongside Morsh. The pair get cocky, resulting in Marsh's death and the ignition of Dak's spark. Back in the present, Dak extracts a hidden lockpick. If I had been long imprisoned in a cavern made of bones on a zombie death world, I think I'd have more tolerance for grossness. After being released, the other prisoner talks about how Sifa was tortured and tested, eventually triggering what we know was her spark. Dak uses psychometry to learn more. <laughs> He realizes Malfagor wants to uncover the secrets of planeswalking and that Sifa went to Ravnica. At that moment, the jailer attacks, joined soon by Malfagor. The other prisoner is killed, really gorily. Dak manages to planeswalk away. Meanwhile, Sifa is back in Ravnica. The spell thief is also strong, but doesn't quite have the same sense of momentum as the first arc. It incorporates various lore elements well, particularly Soren and his pre-existing pragmatism. Next up is issue one of Path of Vengeance. Dak has returned to Ravnica, like the block. He frantically brings an injured Vaklav to Fadka, the healer from earlier. Dak puts him in stasis and is confronted by another thief named Matov, who he has a history with. Matov states that the Rakdos have placed a huge bounty on Dak for his theft of their property. From an apparently human transguild courier, Dak learns that Sifa is working with the Rakdos and has stolen an important document. In a flashback, we see Dak first meeting Vaklav encourages him to sell his stolen artifacts instead of returning them after taking their magic. The colors and angles in the scene really sell the stakes and emotional shift of the scene. On Sifa's trail, Dak runs into a Rakdos demon. He manages to lead it into some Boros forces and escape the ensuing altercation. He reaches one of his safe houses, only to find Matov again. In issue 2, Dak and Matov speak for a bit, before seeing that the demon is still on Dak's tail. Dak unleashes a much more powerful magical attack than I knew he was capable of. Matov is injured in the blast, but Dak rescues him. He flashes back to when they first met, attempting to steal the same Selesian artifact during a ceremony. In the present, Dak takes Matov to Fadka. Vaklav wakes up and is revealed to have betrayed Dak. However, Dak knew he would and forgives him. Matov also wakes up and reveals that Sifa stole an invitation to this year's Selesian ceremony from before. The group realizes that she intends to steal the life force of Vidugazi, which would endanger all of Selesnia, if not all of Ravnica and beyond. They commit to trying to stop it. The issue ends with Sifa and the Rakdos attacking the Conclave. Issue 3 begins with the group rushing across Ravnica, 
fighting Rakdos forces. Tak summons a dragon, who deals with the imps, but also sets their vehicle on fire. After some more misadventures, they crash in some Gorgori ruins. After escaping a giant beetle, they try to buy a boat from some Gorgori, but things go awry, so they steal one instead. Dex states that since he's much more familiar with Ravnica's mana than in Estrad's, he's much more powerful here, explaining his strength in the previous issue. They eventually make it to Selesnia territory, which they find burning. They run through the corpses until they reach Sifa. Issue 4 starts in the same situation, with Dak limiting that he's in over his head. After Sifa and Dak exchange wards, a giant Rakdos demon begins to attack the trunk of Vidugazi, distracting the Selesnian forces. Dak reiterates that he is at his most powerful in Ravnica and blasts the Rakdos with water. Fatka stabs some people, but is taken out. Metav takes down the giant demon. Dak taps into Ravnica's mana one final time, giving him a psychometric vision of his allies. Vaclav tries to run away. In an awesome splash page, we see the state of the battle. Then Vaclav sneaks up behind Sifa and stabs her, living up to Dak's trust in him and sacrificing himself in the process. Sifa, weakened but alive, is finally killed by Dak. Dak meditates on the damage, but fortunately, Fadka is alive. Dak questions who he is and what he should do now that his quest is over. With a message of unity, he ends the series on a hopeful note. These 12 issues make up what I would consider Dak's first story. I'm not sure why the numbering keeps getting reset. They're clearly very direct continuations of each other. You can designate arcs without restarting the issue count. Comics do it all the time. Regardless, I think this is a great series. It's probably my favorite magic comic. As I've repeatedly discussed, I love the art. The writing is also consistent and strong. Dak has a very satisfying characterization, combining wit, selfishness, selfishness, and vengeance into a compelling anti-hero. Sifa is an okay villain. Her motives never really advance beyond wanting vague power, but her machinations are in tightly enough. I like most of Dak's supporting cast, though I was never really sold on his potential relationship with Ingrid. The series also uses established magic elements really well. Ravnica and Estrad and Grixis all feel true to their sources. Soren is good. All the references to mana and specific cards fit well without being distracting. The comic also introduces new characters and planes well. Most of the new elements are fun, and all of them feel at home in the magic multiverse. All in all, I would definitely recommend this series. Eight months later, Dak would return in Theros. Coca-Cola would continue to illustrate, giving a sense of continuity. But Jason Saramella would take over as writer. Saramella has written licensed and original comics, screenplays, and children's books, and currently works as a visual writer for magic. Issue 1 begins on Ramrica, with Dak breaking into the Boas' sun home. He narrates that they've gained control of an artifact that threatens to unbalance Ramrica. He gets up to it, but is found out by an angel. Unable to grab that gem, he defenestrates himself after grabbing a random bag. He sneaks home and laments his failure. After a lot of negative self-talk, realizes that this is, in fact, someone else's home that he's broken into. Outside, Dak hears his name calling from a gauntlet in the bag. With psychometry, he examines the gauntlet and learns it's from Theros, in an especially well-drawn scene. He heads there, believing that learning more about the gauntlet can help prevent another war in Ravnica. Once there, he is accosted by some muggers, but easily defeats them. A local gets Dak a spot on her father's ship to thank him for dealing with the criminals. Her father is some sort of yak man. The issue concludes with Dak surrounded by the ship's crew. This is an okay start to a new storyline. It doesn't quite reach the same level of clear direction as the Sifa arc, lacking an obvious goal for Dak. Dak's also not written as well as before. He's more of a generic, sarcastic, cool guy than he was the first time around. Issue 2 starts with a fake out, with an unseen Dak begging for mercy, not from the sailors, but from seasickness. Yakman berates him and recaps the plot. The ship reaches Dak's destination, and Yakman warns Dak of an evil present there. They row the final mile, which Dak is a real whiny jerk about. Dak explains that he's looking for the rest of the gauntlet as the group arrives at a cave. Yakman declines to explain his yakness. Dak heads in alone, finding it full of bones and statues. He eventually finds what he's looking for and grabs it. As he does this, creepy voices call out to him. Revealed to be a gorgon and a witch, maybe? Dak manages to escape, but the cave dwellers perform a spell. Yakman states that Dak has earned his respect and reveals his backstory. He was a non-yak boy, but his yakness grew in when he turned 12. No one could explain why, so he asks if Dak's powers could reveal him and his father's past 
so that he'll know if the same thing will happen to his daughter. Dak wants to help, but his powers only work on objects. Yak Man is about to get one when something rocks the boat. We get a nice Thassa reference and a strange joke. The issue ends with a massive Kraken attacking the ship. The attack continues in issue 3. After restating his concern for innocence, Dak tries to use the gauntlet against the Kraken. After struggling some, he taps into its great power. With the gauntlet, he can fly and create massive energy blasts. After bringing down the Kraken, he falls unconscious, but Yakman saves him. Dak apologizes for the damage the Kraken did to the ship, but Yakman says it's a fair exchange for examining his ancestral sword. Dak learns that Yakman's father was an evil hunter who was cursed by God. I think Nylea. He was turned into a beast and killed by his fellow hunters, which is very Greek mythology. It affecting the totally innocent child of the villain is also very Greek mythology. If you enjoy mythology jokes, check out my new Tumblr, where I make a lot of them. In an epilogue, Dak says that he's not sure where to go next, so he'll stick around on Theros for a while. Yakman thanks Dak for his insight and says he'll figure out a way to break his curse. The two part ways for now. Issue 4 begins with Dak sinking in the ocean, being eaten by sea creatures, which he expressed a fear of in the previous issue. He then wakes up from the nightmare. It's been a month since he left the ship, and his nightmares have been getting worse and worse. He doesn't know why, but speculates it could be from the gauntlet or the cave dwellers. He takes the gauntlet out on a walk, like it's a fussy baby. He spent the month fruitlessly examining the gauntlet. Nice Elliot statue. Dak runs into a sleepwalking pyromancer. Another citizen also mentions not being able to sleep. After being woken up, she expresses confusion and frustration. The pyromancer runs off, and Dak chases after her. After Dak catches up to her, she explains her situation. Her name is Atha, and she believes that she's cursed. She also says the same will happen to Dak. It starts with increasingly worse nightmares, and then leads to sleepwalking and sleep violence. She and the other majors were a city were exiled, even though everyone was having nightmares. She's been moving around ever since, searching for peace. Dak is afraid for his future. Atha warns Dak to leave and says that she doesn't know what's causing the curse. She leaves and Dak returns home. He examines the gauntlet again and sees a cryptic vision featuring a silhouette of Ashok. The issue ends with more Ashok imagery as Dak goes to sleep. Issue 5 begins with Winter Soldier Dak being crucified. He attacked a temple while sleepwalking, like Atha warned him about. He says he's been seeing Ashok in his dreams. Ashok is referred to with male pronouns. I guess because this was so early in the character's history, and creative hadn't established things. Atha breaks into the prison to free Dak. Dak flirts with the gauntlet? While escaping, Atha states that she's been seeing Ashok too, and gives their name and deal. They have been going after the mages of Theros to inspire fear. This, combined with the nightmares, has left the population weak and exhausted. Entire villages have been put to magical sleep. Atha thinks Ashak wants to do this to large populations so they can harvest nightmares at a massive scale. After a time skip, Dak questions Atha's plan, which will apparently involve a god. She says that she rescued Dak because he was powerful enough to help, and Dak says he'll do it to help his new friends. The issue ends with Dak venturing into the underworld. Issue 6 starts with nothing, because it does not exist. The series was cancelled on a massive cliffhanger. I haven't been able to find out why. As far as I can tell, the Theros issues did not sell significantly less than the arc before them. If you know, please tell me. I guess it's appropriate to the character that multiple Ashiak stories have been cancelled or cut. Theros is okay. It's hard to judge when it's so unfinished, but I do think it's a step down. Dak has less depth and is less likable. Relatedly, the humor is a lot more inconsistent across the board. The supplementary artists also step in a lot more. They're all good, but it can be distracting when the art style changes halfway through the issue without reason. The overarching plot takes a while to get going, but it had potential for sure. Hello, how are you today? Good, how are you doing? I'm well. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, would you mind explaining to my viewers who you are? Uh, my name is Matt Forbeck. I'm a freelance game designer and author. Uh, I've written countless games uh, over the years, I've written about 35, 40 novels, comic books, video games, all sorts of other things. Thank you. Uh, so let's get started. How involved were you in the creation of Doc Faden as a character? I created him entirely, actually, with well, the basic concept of him, right? Uh, then we had our artist. It wasn't Mar Martin Kokolo was the artist on the book. Uh, there was a concept artist that actually worked. I can't remember the guy's name because um, I was I didn't work with them directly. I just saw some pictures that they actually did the graphic design and the, the look of the character with the red right hand and all that kind of stuff. Um, the original idea for Dak came from me for the thing. 
uh, I was working with the guys at IDW. Denton Tipton was my editor beginning with. Um, and we had a great time working on the book. I got to fly out to uh, Seattle, visit Wizards of the Coast and sit down with them and talk with them and the entire Magic team about all the different plans they had for the different products they were coming out at the time and get the philosophy behind it and learn which kinds of characters I was allowed to use or not use or anything like that. Uh, but part of the thing is I came up with a pitch for the story and uh, I had to come up with an original character for it as well. So Dak was my character for that. Uh, and would you mind expanding on uh, where his character came from um, back in those early days? What, what were you really thinking about? Sure. Uh, you know, I looked at a lot of the other planeswalkers. I wanted to do something a little bit different than what had already been done. Uh, I was a big fan of Thieves from way back uh, for fantasy fiction and Role playing, if you want to go back to D and D before Magic the Gathering, obviously, uh, even back to Fafford and the Gray Mouser from the uh, Fritz Lieber's original stories that were some of the inspiration for Dungeons and Dragons and other fantasy stuff, uh, and Conan even as a thief. If you want to go back to Conan the Barbarian, he was also a thief as well. So I thought, let's do a character who uh, has a good reason to have lots of different adventures, uh, who's maybe interested in stealing things from people, taking power from them, uh, but doing it quietly and cleverly, and and uh, not as worried about whether or not they're creating new magic items, more like swiping things from people. So I thought it'd be kind of fun. Yeah. So something I appreciated in the comic was that it focused on the uh, impacts on his life, like his normal life, that being a planeswalker would be uh, the difficulty in relationships. And that's something that I haven't seen very much uh, elsewhere in the magic story. So that was something I appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I always like those guys who are about mid power to low power, right? You know, I'm more about Batman than Superman, right? Uh, so to be able to do a character who was more like that, who had more challenges, had a bit more of a personal history, that kind of a thing, as opposed to these demigods walking throughout the multiverse, uh, I, that appealed to me more, right? Yeah, I'm very much the same. Um, you can see Batman and Captain America yeah, there behind you go. me. Uh, so you talked a little bit about Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so yeah. what, what all did you talk about? Uh, what resources did they give you? Uh, we had like a two-day meeting where they just sat me down and said, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what all this stuff means. Do you have any questions? Uh, I took notes, you know, uh, went, went over everything fairly uh, extensively. Uh, Brady Donnermuth, I think, was the lead of the story at that time. He had been writing some comics internally for Magic the Gathering. Uh, uh, then I, the IDW got in this license. They had hired me on to do it. Uh, I, we did have some limitations in the stories. They said, you know, um, we want it to be in this realm right uh and because that was the next thing we were coming out with and i thought okay that's great you know you've been to this place before we can go back to it uh but one of the restrictions was that i wasn't allowed to use any of the existing plane walkers from the story right uh so basically i had to come up with my own villain as well and had to i was allowed to borrow a planeswalker or two occasionally right for maybe one issue but they didn't want me explaining their stories too much they uh the people inside the magic were you know, they, they felt uh, some ownership over those characters, right? They Like, these are the characters we've been developing for a long time. Uh, we'd rather have control directly over what they're doing and where they're going. Uh, so why don't you carve out your own uh, section of the multiverse, essentially? It's a big place. And play with that instead. So that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, that's something I've kind of a reoccurring theme I've noticed with subsequent Magic comics is how to tell these stories when they are beholden to so many other Yeah. Uh, machinations you got to find the empty spots on the map right the places mm -hmm. where they say here there be dragons or whatever the places that nobody's interested in developing you get to play with those right and that actually makes it safe it's it's uh, a challenge in one way because you're working with characters and, and situations that maybe uh the the fan base is more interested in the ones that already exist right they're more interested in the characters they already know and such but on the other hand, you don't have to worry about stepping on people's toes as much. You don't have to worry about their plans they might have for these characters. Uh, approvals are a lot easier to get through if you just come up with your own stuff. So, you know, in that sense, it's a trade-off. Uh, so you've mentioned the artist Martin Cocolo. Uh, do you know how uh, they were chosen and what your relationship with him was like? No, I have no idea. That was the editor's... Uh, Justin and uh, and uh, Denton over at IDW lined up all that stuff. I think Justin Eisinger was originally the editor, and then Denton took over after that. They picked out Martine, uh, and it was really maybe, uh, just a matter of, hey, we got this great artist here who's doing some amazing stuff. Uh, we think you guys will work well together. And they were right. I mean, Martine is fantastic. I mean, he's doing stuff for Marvel nowadays that's just jaw-dropping. So I've been uh, very pleased to see his, his career progress as well. He's been doing some fantastic stuff.
Absolutely. I'm yeah. actually working on the Marvel tabletop role playing game. That's my main gig right now. So uh, I get to uh, read a lot of Marvel comics and watching his stuff grow has been fantastic fun. Cool. Yeah, he's my favorite magic comic artist. The way he does color and movement and action. Yeah. It's just I mean, very no, compelling. No, yeah. Not harshing on anybody else, but Martin, Martin does a mm -hmm. fantastic job. He's amazing. And uh, speaking of the villain from before, what was creating Sifa like? And also, by extension, the main plot of the comic? Right. Well, I mean, uh, I started out with Dak and saying, okay, Dax and loses family is going to have a revenge plot going on here, right? So we need to have a character who uh, kills people wantonly uh, without respect for life and uh, who we have a lot of reasons to hate, not just because we've seen them through uh, through Dak's eyes, but we can see the other things they're doing, how they treat the people around them, all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, coming up with somebody who was also a planeswalker who had uh, the kind of ability to just torture Dak uh, throughout was important for that and you know me meshing the two of them up so they actually uh fit well with each other so they you know, it didn't seem like i was just stealing a planeswalker for somebody else and slapping dak against them right uh but to have a character that actually could be a nemesis for dak and they could be for each other that was important right uh sifa had uh, kind of this vampiric feel to her you know she was a little bit pale dark stylish wore a lot of black leather that kind of stuff um so that seemed to feel with it, or fit with that pretty well and Dax more of a down to earth, uh, grungy, wouldn't be doing this if he didn't have to kind of a guy, right? More your Han Solo, Indiana Jones kind of character. And uh, I, I, his rough edges against her refined ones, I thought were a good play as well. Yeah, I think making her a planeswalker made a lot of sense because it allowed for the great cat and mouse uh, interplay of the series. Right. I mean, otherwise he just, you know, planes walks away. What the hell? <laughs> I don't ever have to go back here. It's not going to be much of a story, right? She has to be able to follow him. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he has to be able to hide, and he's good at hiding, fortunately. So uh, it does become something that you can play with over over many, many issues. So you've spoke a little bit about this so far, but how did you decide on the balance between new and returning characters and locations? Because I thought that it has a great right. balance in that regard. Well, mostly I wasn't allowed to touch too many of them. So I would, I would say, hey, guys, I got this great idea for this character, this situation here. Uh, it would work really well with this character. Can I borrow them for this one bit? And they'd say, sure. You know, normally they were pretty accommodating for that kind of stuff. Uh, the boundaries were pretty clear. I wasn't able to take them and use them too often. I wasn't able to develop them uh, beyond what they've already been developed, right? Uh, when you're doing tie-in stuff, we often compare it to uh, playing with somebody else's toys, right? Those are not my toys. I don't own them. Uh, I get to take them off the shelf, mess around with them, bang them against each other, make them do horrible things. But then when I'm done, I have to put them back in the shelf in roughly the condition I found them, right? Now, with a character that I'm allowed to develop, like, you know, uh, like Dak and Sifa, I can do all sorts of wacky things with them. But with other people's characters, essentially, within that universe, that multiverse, uh, I have to be more careful and respectful. So that was really the boundary with it. And uh, that didn't mean I couldn't have fun with them. It just meant that when I was done, I had to say, okay, and then they go back off to do whatever the heck they were doing before. They've just come in for a cameo appearance, essentially. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, where did the ideas for the the new planes that you created come from? Uh, there's the, oh, the core I, collecting one, right. the Middle Eastern one. Oh, I think we just, yeah, you know, I'm like, I need this kind of a thing. I need to have the these things. The collecting one was kind of fun for me that, you know, Dak's kind of a collector. He's going off and stealing stuff. Um, for me, that was actually kind of a Marvel Comics tribute to the collector who was uh, ran the original. It wasn't the Secret Wars. It was the Contest of Champions where he would go through and like collect all the different characters and then have them fight against each other like a kid with toys. Right. I'm like, oh, we could do something like that. That'll be kind of fun. Um, you know, I grew up reading Stan Lee's comics and you know Jim Shooter and all the other good stuff from Marvel over the years. And uh, I'm sure that influenced me deeply while I was working on comic books, right? Those are great visuals to work with, for one. They're very simple concepts. You can show them on a page a lot. You don't have to do a whole text dump saying, and this is what all, all this means, right? You can just show them right there, as opposed to having to explain everything to people. Comics is very much a visual medium. I mean, there's a lot of text that goes into it, but the text in a lot of ways is subservient to the imagery, right? You want the imagery to be able to do a lot of the work for you. And again, I was very fortunate to uh, partner up with Martin because he did an amazing job of that. Yeah, I very much got the collector vibe from that. Yeah. That was cool to see. Uh, if you're comfortable saying, what led to your departure from the series at the end of those first 12 issues? I had a 12-month contract, 12-issue contract. And when the contract was up, they're like, well, we're going to try it with somebody else. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I would have been happy to keep writing on it. I, I, my guess is 
the sales of the issues weren't as strong as they wanted to be. Um, I don't think that it was the writing or the art. I just think that, you know, Magic the Gathering fans aren't always comic book fans, right? As we've seen over the years, we've seen a lot of comics come and go. Uh, I forget the name of the writer who took over after me, but it didn't last even another year. So again, I don't think it was uh, a matter of the quality of what we were putting out. It was a matter of, uh, I think most of the sales were going to Magic players who were like, hey, there's an exclusive card in the bag. Let me go grab that. So, uh, and we, yeah, we try to hook them in with good stories and have fun with it as well. But um, they weren't up to the level, I guess, that they were looking for. I mean, you know, IDW publishes some pretty good selling stuff along with like Transformers and things like that. So, you know, they're uh, looking for bigger numbers sometimes. And if they don't show up, then they have to cancel. That's just, you know, the business as how it works. So I, again, I would have been happy to keep writing it. It was no skin off my nose. I have plenty of other projects. Like I say, I'm very busy with lots and lots of other things. Uh, so if I get a chance to go back to it, I'd be delighted to. But, you know, it's okay. I go off and write video games and other stuff from Marvel and DC and whatever else. Yeah. Yeah, I've done... No a, hard feelings. I like those guys. They're good people. <laughs> I've done a few videos on some of the other Magic comics. It does seem that they run into recurring difficulties, yeah. which is a shame. But yeah, is, but a lot of these licensed things, fantasy comics are a hard sell. There's not mm -hmm. a, an original fantasy comic that's selling too well. Jim Zub does pretty well skull kickers, but it goes in on and off and, you know, he's not publishing at the moment. I can't think of any non-licensed fantasy comics. Conan's done pretty well over the years, but even Conan goes periods, go through periods where it doesn't sell at all and doesn't have a, a, a series. Other than that, you know, how many can you think of that actually have an ongoing presence? Dungeons and Dragons hasn't managed, even with Zub writing a lot of the stuff. Uh, Pathfinder hasn't managed it. Magic hasn't managed it. D&D hasn't managed it. <laughs> you know, comic book fans tend to want superheroes, right? Part of what we were doing with the Magic the Gathering series is like going, okay, well, we can have magic-based superheroes, right? We can do that kind of stuff because they got amazing powers. But again, you know, it's still fantasy. And um the two don't always mix well as well together as superheroes and fantasy and comic books do. So just, you know, if, if somebody can crack that nut, they'll be doing some great stuff. They'll be doing some amazing things and have amazing sales, but it's, you know, uh, a lot of people have been working on it for decades now. And if I took my shot and it didn't work, I'll take another shot some other time, hopefully. And when somebody does crack it, I'm going to be first in line to buy all the comics. So I'm a little bit behind, but the, the current broom series is, is quite good uh, where I left yeah. off on it. Good, good, good. I'll have to catch up with that. So, um, if you're allowed to say, uh, what were your plans for continuing if they if they asked you back? Oh man, it's been so many years right now. I don't even remember mm -hmm. to be honest. With you. Um, and I probably shouldn't say a lot of this stuff comes under what they call a non disclosure agreement. Mm -hmm. right? So you're allowed to talk about what's been revealed publicly. Um, but you're not allowed to talk about stuff that's behind the scenes or what would have been planned, especially because, again, I don't own any of that. That's owned by Hasbro, essentially, right? So a large multinational corporation with lots of lawyers. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I do work with uh, Hasbro and Hasbro licensees a lot over the years. I've signed lots of these NDAs. It's not my property. I don't get to tell stories out of school for that. So Makes sense. Uh, what was your reaction to Dak getting his own card eventually? I love that. Right? It's like, oh, that's cool. You know, just uh, it's one of those things you're like, well, I'm going to come up with this thing and let's see if it has any effect upon the thing that it's based upon. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, for instance, I'm doing a Marvel tabletop role playing games right now. Who knows? Maybe they'll integrate some of that stuff into the comics. That would be freaking awesome. Right. Uh, you because you start doing a lot of the stuff because you're a fan of it. Right. You don't just do it because it's uh, a paycheck. I mean, the paycheck's nice. But uh, if you can't figure out a way to become a fan of what you're working on and the stuff you're, you're working with, then I think it comes across as hollow, right? And you want to have something that's authentic that uh, the other your fellow fans can also enjoy. And when you see something like that come up, you're like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Yeah, just talking with you, your appreciation for magic and Marvel is really clear. And that I, I know that shows up in your work. I'm a professional geek. You know, I get paid to do it, but I'm also a geek. I started out that way very young. That's the dream. Yeah. Uh, so what was your reaction to Dak's unfortunate death in 2019? You know, I didn't know about it at the time. <laughs> I just came up. I was like, oh, wow, he got killed off at some point. Like, you know, I understand. I, I mean, I would like to have seen him go on forever. But again, that's one of those situations where he wasn't a main character. He wasn't created in-house. So the, the people were working on that stuff 
don't feel the same ownership for him as they do for other characters. Right. So if they have to pick out somebody to knock off because they want to emphasize how deadly somebody is or whatever, uh, which is often the reason you, you, you remove a character or kill them, um, then the, he made a perfect choice. I mean, it was you know, an easy choice. I mean, are, are you going to do that? Or are you going to do one of the big ones that you've been working with forever that you love desperately as a creator, right? Or are you going to take somebody else's character and say, well, you know, I think he could go, right? Makes sense. Um Again, you know, one of the things about the multiverse and everything else is death is not always permanent. Hell, I mean, I've read enough comics and enough fantasy that uh, there's always a chance Dak will come back. You know, if somebody says, Matt, how do you do it? I'm like, well, I can come up with six ways and, you know, we'll figure out which one we, we think is the best and feels the most authentic. Um, I'd be happy to do that. But, you know, I don't have any ill will against anybody for doing it as long as they send them off well. Right. That's OK. Uh, you know, I also write for Halo, for instance, and um I killed off a major, or not, I killed off a character in one of the Halo books. People give me endless grief about that to this day, right? <laughs> it's because they cared about it. So that's how it works, right? That's what you do. And, and ideally, when you do something like that, you do it with care and respect for the fans because you're a fan just as much as they are. Yeah, so um, you can actually see him in the trailer for one of Magic's most prominent sets, story-wise, uh, involves his death. So it's very dramatic and, and eye-catching. Yeah, exactly. So if you got to go away, you know, it's not a bad way to go. Hopefully people remember you well. So. I think perhaps him dying gave him more attention than he'd ever had before because he was so prominent Again, in that trailer. Uh, exactly. That's a good thing. You know? And, uh, and, you know, it's part of that magic multiverse now. It's part of the story. I'm excited about that. I'm flattered by it. And I hope that brought people to the comic. It's like, oh, yeah, me too. Who's this? Exactly. Uh, who's this character? And How do I know more about his story? I mean, nowadays, you know, if you don't have the comic, everybody looks this crap up on, uh, you know, Wikipedia or uh, whatever page and figure it out. And you're like, okay, great. You know, if they if they're intrigued by that version of the story, hopefully you go out and buy the uh, collected editions or wherever else they can find. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely hope this video encourages people to go back and read those comics because I, I do really enjoy them. That'd be great. I don't get a royalty on any of that, but I still want you to read it. It's good. <laughs> it's. Not for my sake, but I think you'll have some fun with it, hopefully. Well, kind of related to that, uh, for my final question, for those who do enjoy uh, your magic comic, what of your other work kind of scratches that same itch would you recommend to them? Yeah, I've got a, uh, a series of novels and games now called Shotguns and Sorcery, which are kind of it's set in this uh, magic. Uh, it's basically set in a world where the zombies have taken over everywhere except for this one mountain where a dragon has protected everybody and founded an empire. And it's kind of got this 1930s Raymond Chandler meets J.R.R. Tolkien kind of feel, kind of the way that Dak feels a lot of the time, right? It's the you know the the uh, the man who has to walk down the mean streets lest he become mean and do things to help other people. There's a lot of that going on in shotguns and sources. We have a fifth edition source book that uh, I'm going to be releasing shortly. It already went out to the Kickstarter backers, and we have a cipher system role playing game using the system that was designed by Monty Cook Games and such, where the guys who did third edition D and D. Uh, and we also have, I think, three novels and a number of short stories for that. So go check that stuff out. I think if you like that kind of fantasy and that kind of uh, tone and the banter, I think you'll like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love the balance with Dak's character. He's selfish and selfless at the same time. Yeah, exactly. I like that, too. It feels real, right? Very fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me on. Over the years, Dak has had a few card appearances and mechanical representations. Outside of the comic inserts, Dak's first card appearance was in the art of a random card in May 2013's Dragon Maze. He has no role in the set story, so it's unclear why he's on this card. I've seen it theorized that it was sledge art from the comic production. Next up was the favorite text of Artificer's Hex in July 2013's Magic 2014. This started the trend of many of his cards being fairly one-note references to his thief status. In September of that year, Dak was given a deck in the expansion pack of the digital game Magic 2014 Duels of the Planeswalkers. This was the first confirmation of his Is It color identity. His deck has a counter burn playstyle, which seems appropriate to his power set in the comics. We also get his bio. Dak was popular enough to be given a card in June 2014's Conspiracy which takes place on his home plane of Fiore. Though someone didn't read the comic all that well, because Pagliano was not his current hometown in that story. He was the first ever supplemental set planeswalker. Eric Deschamps, who first created Dak's look and did one of the covers for the first issue of the comic, did his card as well, which was a neat touch. Prior to the reveal that Dak would appear, 
Mark Rosewater gave so many hints on his blog. Seriously, he gave like a dozen of these responses in late 2013 and early 2014. Around this time, multiple people indicated their disinterest in Dak, with the most common complaint being that he was generic or dull. This certainly wasn't a universal opinion, though. The card really leans into his thieving abilities. It's had some success in both competitive and commander, leading to a few reprints. It got new art for the Mythic Edition and a secret layer. Two other cards in the set reference him, Dax Duplicate and Central Dispatch. There's also a misspelled reference to his hometown. Are these the reanimated corpses of his loved ones? Wow. By 2015, Rosewater indicated that Dak appearing again was not a given or immediately likely. Dak, like most Planeswalkers, was considered for the War of the Spark set, though he was ultimately cut in favor of Sahili and Rao. Dak was added to the War of the Spark novel after the set's Planeswalker designs had been locked in, preventing him from appearing there. I will discuss that novel later. There was a certain amount of confusion and backlash to his absence. Had his role in the novel been known earlier, he would have been included in the set, but the various moving parts didn't allow for it. Rosewater has stated that wizards will try to avoid something like that happening again. April 2021's Mystical Archives version of D Spark features Dax's death in its full art. An incredible piece, by the way. However, he's cropped out of the actual card. If that's not the ultimate metaphor for his general treatment by wizards, I don't know what is. Finally, a rather ghoul-faced Dak appears in the art of one of the premium versions of Aether Vial from Double Masters 2022. I always enjoy when reprints show a planeswalker in a new location. I hope Dak enjoyed Kaladesh. Maybe run into fellow Fjorin Doretti. Rosewater has indicated the possibility of Dak appearing posthumously in a supplemental set. The Dak Ages. Outside of his comics, Dak had a very minor role in the magic story prior to War of the Spark. He does not appear in the stories of Return to Ravnica or Conspiracy, despite being referenced in cards. 2014 and 2015 articles giving the current status of each planeswalker give no new information on him. His bio contains only four sentences recapping the very earliest events of his life. His grand reintroduction to the story began with the World of the Spark trailer in March of 2019, which prominently features his death. Next month, he would appear as one of 11 protagonists in Greg Weissman's War of the Spark, Ravnica novel. I'm also including details from the Rats Perspective chapters from the Magic website, released in the following months. I'm only going to recap his parts because this video is way too long already. Enjoy these fun visuals. Dak's first chapter begins with him planeswalking poorly in Ravnica and wondering if any other planeswalkers ever do the same thing. This references the first ever planeswalk we see him make in the comic. He had just been on Innistrad, having failed to steal any number of artifacts he had been scoping out. He owes money to an Orzhov ghost, which the artifacts could have paid for. He's more bumbly and down his luck here than we've seen him before. He was called Ravnica by what the readers know was the interplanar beacon. He climbs and runs around Ravnica, intending to get to the bottom of things. In Bolas' chapter, he notes that he is aware of Dak's presence on Ravnica. In his next chapter, Dak sees the Eternal Army crawling out of the portal and attacking Ravnican civilians. Calling back to his characterization in the comic, Dak declares that even though he's not a fighter, he won't let another massacre happen on his watch. Fortunately, he once stole a spell that kills the undead, the only one at a time. He manages to distract the Eternals from the civilians, but they're now all focused on him. He's able to get away and decides to head towards the portal. Next, Dak catches up on the events of the rest of the book. He watches his old friend, Fidugazi, kill Eternals before getting killed itself. He sees Bolas seated in his throne. He sees the Boas retreat. He sees Dormwe declare allegiance to Bolas and subsequently get desparked. Across Ravnica, sparks are harvested by Eternals. Dak panics and tries to planeswalk away, but can't due to the Immortal Sun. He cries at this realization and runs. All of the planeswalkers gather, including a nervous Dak. Rilly attempts to confront him for his thievery, which is a nice callback to the beginning of Theros. Kaden stops her. Rat reveals that she's been studying Dak's work, but lost track of him on several occasions, which she now knows was from his planeswalking. Dak flirts with Sahili while eyeing her jewelry, calling back to an alternate cover of the very first issue of his comic. The group decides to split up and head on different tasks. Dak cautions against trying to surrender to Bolas. Before heading out, Dak tries to use his powers on Kiora's Thassa's Bident, which doesn't work out. In his next chapter, Dak Karn, Samut, and Obnixilis are tasked 
with going through the planar bridge and disabling it from the other side. Nixilis tries to scare Dak throughout the mission, while Karn defends him. Dak says he volunteered for the mission partially out of self-preservation, as it will get him off of Ravnica. He also fears a certain amount of responsibility for his adopted home and his friends there, they mean three that I don't recognize. However, he feels his mission will be enough, and he can leave things to the real heroes after. Dak uses magic to turn the Eternals by the bridge against each other. Nixilis flies Dak through the portal. After momentarily losing consciousness, Dak wakes up in Amonkhet. He's embarrassed to have been hit harder than the others. The Eternals don't attack them, as apparently their only directive here is to walk through the portal. Samet prays to Hazret. The group tears through the Eternals until they reach Tezzeret. Dak manages to gain control of his mechanical arm. This distracts him long enough for the group to destroy the portal. Tezzeret, who wishes for Bolas to lose, but couldn't cross him directly, planeswalks away. Hazor arrives with Sarkon, and Dak is stricken by the god's power and beauty, but this lessens after Nixilis mocks him, and Dak realizes she didn't help. She says that she got there as soon as she could, and explains what she and the other Amonkhet survivors have been doing. The group decides her spear may work against Bolas. His part done, Nixilis planeswalks away. This inspires Dak to stay, as he recognizes that for all his flaws, he's not like Nixilis, Bolas, or Tezzeret. Tezzeret tells him he's a better man than he thinks, which he doubts. She restates her faith in him. The other planeswalkers return to Ravnica, like the cycle. Dak shakes off the impulse to run away, and follows them. Back in Ravnica, Dak joins the fight against the Eternals. He gets distracted, but is saved by Sarkhan. He and the Wanderer both look at him with disapproval. He then talks some about his past, explaining what happened after the comic. He traded the gauntlet to cure the sleeping curse. He then feels the immortal sun has been shut off. All around him, planeswalkers begin to leave. He desperately wants to, too, but seeing the wander inspires him not to. He says to himself that he can just planeswalk away if he's in immediate danger. He chooses to be the kind of person who stays. Later, the planeswalkers reconvene again. Dax sits on Asperia, which is based. He backs Gideon's plan to turn the immortal sun back on to prevent Bolas from escaping. This represents Dak's character growth, as he is giving up his ability to run away. Dak joins in the final assault on the Citadel. He's terrified, compared the experience to the nightmares Ashiok gave him. He also discusses how Ashiok was defeated, mentioning Ravos and the dead of Theros. Hanging out behind Bobrygmos, he figures out that he can magnetize Eternos to each other. He loses Bobrygmos, but finds Karn, who he knows will look out for him. He gets distracted and almost dies, but Karn saves him. He deals with many Eternals and witnesses much heroism around him. Even though he's never really considered setting him down and having kids, he dreams about telling his grandchildren about the battle and his role in it. Breaking out of his distraction, he finds himself facing another Eternal. He feels a hand on his shoulder, who he believes is Karn saving him again. However, it's actually another Eternal, gripping him. Dak breaks its neck, but doesn't loosen its grip. He tries to planeswalk away, but can feel the immortal sun has been turned back on. He tries to fight back, but is too weak. He is in incredible pain as his soul is ripped out and his body turned into a husk. As he dies, he thinks of Dormri, Athra, Sifa, and Marsh. Poor Ingrid. And lastly, he thinks of Mariel. He begins to cry and wonders who it's for. He hopes it's for her. This is his final thought. He dies and the pain stops. Across the battlefield, Kaya, Teo, and Rat separately see Dak die. Teo remarks that he and Dak exchange words of reassurance before the battle and feels guilty that he couldn't save him. This might be the most controversial opinion I've ever given in a video. I think World of the Spark Ravnica is fine. It's generally competently written. I'd put it on the lower end of the average magic fiction quality. I think that the reputation of its sequel has affected people's memory of it. In terms of Dak, I also think there's a misconception that Dak doesn't have an actual story and basically shows up and immediately dies without fanfare. That's not the case. I'll talk more about his death later, but he does have an arc. It's a tragic one, but it's clearly there. That's not to say that I don't have criticisms of the novel and its handling of Dak. For one, it goes hard on characterizing him as a bumbling, absent-minded loser in comparison to the other planeswalkers. This was never really a thing in the comics, at least not to this extent, so it feels weird here. He also mostly lost his coolness. I didn't like it when he was generically cool in Theros, but I also don't like when he's entirely stripped of his coolness here. All of his self-doubt about whether he's a good person or a hero is also undercut by the fact that he literally saved Ravnica and probably helped save Theros. On the positive side though, I think his death is genuinely touching. I also think the various callbacks to the comic are handled well. 
It's cool that Theros finally got a resolution. It's sweet that he thinks about important people from his life as he's dying. Though again, poor Ingrid. His eclectic power set is also true to the comics. Post-war, Dak's one story inclusion so far was an Easter egg in May 2022's Note for a Stranger. A Planeswalker bulletin board features many messages from across the multiverse, including an old one from Paliano Fiora. In a now-deleted post, the author confirmed this was a reference to Dak. Concluding thoughts. The tweet I was talking about so long ago made one other point when comparing Dak to Waluigi. They are both excluded from a product specifically marketed as including everyone ever. I'd like to discuss why I think he was excluded from that set and by extension, why Wizards was okay with him being killed off. I think there are a lot of factors that spiral into each other. Neither Wizards nor the player base have ever generated enough excitement about Dak to influence the other party. I like Dak, or at least I like the idea of Dak. I liked him in the first 12 issues of his comic, but he's been pretty so-so ever since. He's a character with potential, but that potential has rarely been met. Wizards doesn't seem all that interested in him, given that they haven't featured him much at all in sets or stories. And unlike characters like Garrick or Koth, they never bothered to reassure players that they had a plan in mind for him, which makes me think they didn't. But few references to him do exist on cards, go super in on his thief status to the extent a player could be forgiven for thinking he was very one-note. I'm not surprised that a lot of players thought he was boring or generic. Additionally, certain fans may have an inaccurate perception of Dak's overall popularity. Since Wizards never really invested in the character, he didn't grow much awareness outside of a core group of fans. And in that time, he developed a lot of competition. There are several Is It Planeswalkers who are much more prominent than Dak, including one focused on artifacts. Across the colors, there are so many artifact-related planeswalkers, many of whom are also more prominent than Dak. There are also more prominent thief characters. Dak just doesn't have a great niche. And I also wonder if he's potentially hamstrung by artifact theft perhaps being difficult to design around mechanically, because it's too rare an effect and or difficult to balance. A character's power set being difficult to design around does have a relationship with how upset designers are with the character's death. The fact that they went so in on his artifact theft means that his spell stealing and copying abilities, which would probably be more mechanically flexible, would likely feel incongruent to most players' perception of the character. When it comes to the deaths in War of the Spark, something I'm frustrated by is the fact that an equal amount of Rothos seem to be upset that not enough characters died as are upset that characters died, without recognizing that that makes it pretty much impossible to craft a story that satisfies everyone. I've even seen some people make both complaints. You can't have it both ways. You can't kill off established characters without killing off established characters. And I recognize the nuance in the situation. How many people are specifically upset with how the deaths were handled? But a lot of people are just upset that there was any death at all, or that most of the characters didn't die. Again, these are very opposing complaints. As for Dak, as stated, I thought his death was well written. No, he didn't die during something incredibly impressive, but that tragedy can be satisfying in its own right. And if Wizards felt they had to kill off some characters, which a lot of players expected and wanted, for as much as I like Dak, he's the perfect choice. He's got a backstory. A lot of players will at least recognize him. His death will be more impactful than that of a new character, or a complete unknown like Estrid. But at the same time, evidence points to Wizards not having any active plans for him, or any particular fondness for the character. He just doesn't seem like someone that they're all that interested in designing for or writing for. Meanwhile, another important factor is that for most Planeswalkers, if you kill them, you are killing one of a very few, or potentially the only, Planeswalker of a certain category. Be that a real world identity, mechanical focus, color identity, or species. That is not the case for Dak. If you collected all the most frequently occurring Planeswalker traits and put them all together, the result would probably heavily resemble Dak, especially the more one-note Dak that we see a lot of the time. All things considered, they probably gained more than they lost by killing him off. And that's not to say I like how Dak's character has been handled throughout the years. I wish Theos was better and finished. I wish he showed up more in the story. I wish his depth was better presented on cards. And I wish he was in the World of Spark set. But with where the character was when the story was being written, I understand why he died. I remember how impactful the War of the Spark trailer was, and Dak was certainly a notable part of that. I think a lot of the current awareness of and fondness for Dak is a response to his death. The truth is that passion just wasn't there when he was alive. To paraphrase a song that a kid sung in my middle school talent show that I was forced to attend, 
You only know you love him when you let him go. Goodbye, Doc Faden. In the end, it was our hearts that you stole. Thank you so much for getting to the end of this very long video. It was the most ambitious that I've ever done, and I had a lot of fun wrangling its various parts. Massive thanks to Mr. Forbeck. Definitely check out his work. His website is linked below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Leaving those comments truly helps the channel, as does subscribing, sharing, liking, and supporting me on Patreon. Big thanks to my current patrons for their support. If you'd like to join them in getting early access to videos and behind the scenes content, that's linked below. Again, thank you all so much. I really hope this washes out.